Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We will begin in just a moment. We're going to let everyone populate the room and we'll get started. And if you're just joining us, we will begin shortly. Okay, looks like we have a good group. Welcome to our webinar on ultrasound visualization for hemodialysis cannulation. Before we begin, please be advised, all attendees are muted. You may type in questions into the Q&A box at the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. We will conduct a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future reference. Here with us today, we have Kristen Armstrong and Carol Stavely. Kristen is a clinical application specialist with Fujifilm Sonosite, and she is a licensed sonographer with 20 years of experience. Kristen will be helping us with some basic demonstrations today. And Carol Stavely is the Director of Strategic Initiatives for Fujifilm Sonosite Canada. Carol is going to introduce our speaker today. And now I will hand it over to you, Carol. Hey everyone, I am truly honored to be introducing your speaker today. Um, since graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 1995, Adrian Barrett has been focused on caring for dialysis patients for the last 25 years. Adrian is currently the Body Access Independent Dialysis Nurse for the Health Sciences North Nephrology Program in Sudbury, Ontario, where she contributes to a multidisciplinary patient-centered care team. Her responsibilities include knowledge sharing at symposia and conferences, contributing to task groups for the Ontario Renal Network. Adrienne is passionate about implementing new approaches that bring value to both clinicians and patients. And this is why she was an early adopter of ultrasound guidance in hemodialysis cannulation. She continues to be a strong advocate for this practice, and she'll be sharing with you some great insights that she's acquired by diving in, learning, and doing. And I know you'll get a lot out of her presentation today. So Adrian, take it away. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us today to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart and I spend far too much of my spare time thinking about. So um, without further ado, let us begin. So by providing you with today's education session, I think it's only prudent for us to discuss what we hope the learning objectives will be. Uh, at the end of this particular educational session related to ultrasound guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit, I will hope that you will be able to do the following. First, list evidence and expert opinion supporting ultrasound use for successful cannulation in the dialysis unit. Second, understand what is involved in becoming proficient at ultrasound use for cannulation. Three, list a number of potential fistula and graft-related issues that can be identified with the ultrasound. And four, begin making the case to initiate ultrasound guided cannulation at your institution if this has not already been adopted. Often when we perform any kind of nursing task, it is prudent for us to understand the best practice guidelines that can back up those tasks we perform. As it relates to ultrasound guided cannulation, in truth, there are limited guidelines to support the use of it. But that's just because it's fairly new in our industry and it's something that's building up momentum. If we were to look at, for example, the KDOKI guidelines for clinical practice related to vascular access. These guidelines are dated uh, 2018, but correct me if I'm wrong, I think the publication of these guidelines just came out this past April, 2020. Guideline 12.2 states that KDOKI considers it reasonable to use ultrasound to help determine direction and flow and proper needle placement and selects patients as needed and performed by trained operators to prevent cannulation complications. In that same guideline, an export opinion indicates the use of bedside ultrasound to aid in cannulation has been associated with increase in nurse competence, pain comfort, and can help determine direction of the flow of the access. 
You will notice the first one on the slide indicates it's a guideline. And if you can recall, guidelines are based on a rigorous review of existing research out there to support it. So there's usually lots and lots of research articles that will support it. Often, there's not enough research out there to support a really good thought. Um, while there is research out there related to ultrasound use, there isn't enough. And I think in the nursing profession, we need to keep in mind that continuing research and taking hold of research opportunities can only help in moving our practice forward. The expert opinion would have been based also on research, but there wouldn't have been enough research out there to make it a guideline. So that's why you've got the two listed here, a guideline and an expert opinion. There was also within those recent KDOKI guidelines, a special discussion that stated centers with limited opportunities for staff to cannulate dialysis accesses face particular challenges. Accessing online resources, such as this education session that Sonicide is offering you today, and expertise should be considered to ensure the provision of adequate care to patients. I think it's fair to say that everybody's aware of the fact that there are varying sizes of dialysis units throughout the world. Even if I were to uh, take the focus to the province in which I live, which is Ontario, there are multiple dialysis units and they are multiple sizes. And the infrastructure within those units varies based on the population and the number of staff members. So it can be very difficult to initiate the use of ultrasound guidance when you have a really small unit, possibly have limited access to arm accesses like chillers and graphs that you're going to use. Something that's possible to do if you decide to make it a priority within your practice. On further note related to guidelines, if we take a look at the Canadian Association of Nephrology Nurses and Technologists, or CANT, um, the nursing recommendations from 2015 state, the use of portable ultrasound for access assessment and ultrasound guided cannulation can optimize cannulation and ensure correct needle placement. And I think I'm correct in saying in that no hemodialysis nurse presents at the bedside wanting to fail at the cannulation. We would like to have success because frankly, success just makes our day go better and gives the patient the best outcomes. So there are several articles that I often have looked at related to ultrasound as, as I've been trying to figure out how do I create an education package to support this? How do I encourage others to use this particular skill set and to make it a priority within their own practice? And I'm going to be listing three of those articles here that I thought were prudent. This first one is by Kamata et al. And it uh, essentially goes over why ultrasound should be used. Um, it states that patients presenting in our dialysis units are presenting with more complex vascular accesses. And that's happening mostly because individuals with pre-existing comorbid conditions are living longer with those conditions. And when they present for creation of a vascular access, their vessels might just barely meet the guidelines for creation of that access. And as a result, when they present in front of us for their first dialysis treatment and their initial cannulation, you're looking at an access that doesn't make you go, yay, that's huge, I'm gonna have no problem getting the needles in, as opposed, you're gonna look at it and go, oh, oh, we've got a challenge here. So it suggests that use of ultrasound in those circumstances can help create positive outcomes. It also addresses the use of ultrasound for such things as uh, central venous catheter insertions, but it does address arm accesses. So that's a good access for that reason. The second article here by Soch et al. Uh, acknowledges that evidence to support ultrasound use as guided cannulation. And they created a study to inform sample size calculations for future multi-site trials. So this is a good idea of how to format uh, research that's needed to support ultrasound and make it a standing guideline internationally if we can. And this third article is by Marta Karina et al. It reviews exactly how to support competencies related to ultrasound guided cannulation in your dialysis unit. It says that theory plus practice 
with the use of simulation learning can help have the best outcomes. And it actually lists competencies that you can try to have your staff achieve in order to become proficient at the use of ultrasound. So these are some good examples if you're trying to figure out how, how do I instill this and how can I make this, this practice in the nursing profession more meaningful. So let us discuss the essential benefits of ultrasound because of course we're only gonna use it if it will potentially help us. A proficient operator, ultrasound operator in the hemodialysis unit could result in the following. Increased confidence in the nurse performing the cannulation. I can't tell you how many times I have presented at the bedside of an individual who, when I look at my daily schedule of patients that you're going to cannulate, makes me break out into a sweat. Somebody is on that list who I have encountered major difficulties cannulating in the past. If I'm lucky, I'm working with under indication and I might be able to call them over for assistance. But knowing how fast paced the work is now in our units, knowing how acute patients are in our units and our ability to call over our coworkers to the bedside gets harder and harder as we have more and more to do. And the stress that we feel with increased workload, and then you add something like this pandemic on top of that, Oh, you don't have to tell me, we're all stressed out to the max. If you can do anything to increase your confidence so that when you present at the bedside, the least of your worries is the cannulation difficulties you might encounter, then I say maybe it's worth thinking about adopting this as a priority for your toolbox of skills. So let's forget about us. Let's just talk about first and foremost, the patient who's being cannulated. There are suggestions that the use of ultrasound in the hemodialysis unit can decrease the anxiety that the patient being cannulated feels. And I can only imagine what it would be like to be on the other side of the fence presenting with a complex access in my arm and having in my mind, I know these three nurses have had success, but this stranger in front of me today, oh, I'm worried. Well, if that stranger in front of you today confidently showed up at the bedside in body language, you know, they're relaxed. They're like, hi, how are you? My name is, oh, I'm just going to use the ultrasound here. If I saw that and I was in the role of a patient, I think it would actually have a positive impact. I think that it would decrease my stress and anxiety. And as nurses and as patient advocates, um, I think it's reasonable to suggest that we would like to do anything that will make the patient experience better perhaps ultrasound can fit the bill there. And then naturally from all of that, if we could have less incidence of interstitial events or missed cannulations, which can cause acute damage to the dialysis vascular access, that's only a good thing. Another benefit of using the ultrasound. I think I'm not um, talking out of my ear here when I say that if you have a complex access that presents in front of you, and then that patient experiences consecutive missed cannulations with dialysis treatments, there's a very good chance that that access will become unusable while it needs time to convalesce. And that could result in the insertion of a central venous catheter while we give time for that access to rest. If we can avoid such a procedure as the central venous catheter insertion, that is one less intervention that this patient has to go through. And often when you're on dialysis, it's a chronic situation and you have long-term experience with the healthcare system. The less interventions okay. that we can, I found this oh, sorry, Siri's talking to me there. The less interventions we can provide for our chronic patients, the better. So with the benefits of ultrasound, I think your number one question might be, if you're not proficient at this time, why does using the ultrasound frustrate me so much? It adds stress. It doesn't take away stress, Adrian. So I, I'm not buying into what you're saying. You need to have patience with yourself. It takes time. There's actual suggestions out there that it could take up to 500 cannulations in a row before you come, become proficient at using the ultrasound for guided cannulation. That seems like a lot, and it is. But that doesn't mean that through that journey, you're not increasing proficiency, increasing your confidence, decreasing miscannulations. It's frustrating. 
but I'd like to think that I'm one of the individuals in our profession who has obtained a certain level of proficiency when it comes to using the ultrasound. And let me tell you, it's fantastic to walk into a dialysis unit, to be called to the bedside to assist with a complex cannulation and to not have additional stress. I know that if I take my time, if I use the skill set I've worked hard to, uh, to create for myself, then I'm going to have the best possible outcomes that I have. Doesn't mean I'm never going to miss again, but it certainly means that I've experienced a lot less missed cannulations in my practice. And I'll take that for sure. So we're nurses. We're not trained sonographers. We are not using this ultrasound as a diagnosis tool. We are using it to help us cannulate. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a basic understanding of exactly how the ultrasound works. So let's review uh, a few basics of ultrasound physics. So essentially the ultrasound machine produces an electrical energy that travels through the machine to the probe itself. The ultrasound probe or transducer turns this energy into sound waves and sends those sound waves into the tissues that the transducer is sitting on. In this case, it's the probe sitting on the vascular access of the dialysis patient. The sound waves travel into the body and bounce off of structures within the body. They return that information to the transducer and the transducer takes this energy, and energy back in electrical energy and produces an image on the ultrasound machine. So essentially it's taking a 3D situation and turning it into a 2D picture that can provide us with information. Here I have an example of what a cannula can look like inside of an access. In this particular circumstance, this is a Teflon cannula, or we call them supercaths, in a fistula. There's three different areas uh, three different words I have on the screen here, hyperechoic, anechoic, and hypoechoic. And you might see these words used regularly when you're looking at ultrasound reports. I don't use them when I am charting and reporting on my experience with cannulating accesses, but I like to understand how ultrasound works and that's why I'm introducing it here in this, in this circumstance. So you can see I've got arrows pointing to, um, for example, hyperechoic structures. That's structures within the arm where the sound waves bounce off very easily and they tend to produce a bright white image. So the cannula is very visible here, um, as is the anterior or back wall of the fistula. This was a well-developed fistula with a really thick vessel wall and that's why you can see it well. Anechoic are structures through which sound waves travel easily. And in this circumstance, it's pointing at the blood that's actually flowing through this fistula the blood is absorbing the sound waves and it's traveling through the blood very easily. I hope, Kristen, you can correct me if I'm making any mistakes here with my explanation of ultrasound physics. And then hypoechoic, the sound waves tend to bounce off, but you don't get a very bright white image. You might get varying degrees of grayscale. Thus, your image turns up in black, white, and gray imaging. When it comes to the type of ultrasound transducers or probes, that matters. You need to have the correct one for the um, ultrasound imaging that you're going to be doing. So in the case of vascular accesses and guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit, a linear array transducer or probe is what is needed. And this is the probe used for venous cannulations. So not only does it you get used for cannulating arm accesses, but you might find some of the uh, doctors in your practice might use it for cannulating uh, femorals or jugular veins. This, of course, is an image of the transducer we use in my unit. So let's get right into the nitty gritty then, because the slide says we should. So using the ultrasound for cannulation, how do you perform a cannulation using the ultrasound? Okay, that's a loaded question. I've got here on the right of this particular slide deck a couple of images about how to hold the probe, orientation of the probe. The image on the left shows a ultrasound probe in, in a linear 
fashion here. So what it is is a longitudinal view of a vessel. That tube underneath the probe is indicative of a vessel. That blue rectangle underneath the probe shows the area in which the sound waves travel out of the probe. And that area is only about the thickness of a credit card. So when you can hold your probe in this way when you're cannulating, or you can do what is called a cross-sectional view, which is on the right-hand side, the image on the right-hand side. That is holding the probe so that it it's, uh, looks through the uh, vessel itself, almost like how when you slice a loaf of bread, you can see the inside. That's what a cross-sectional view does. Whereas a longitudinal view would be cutting the bread completely the wrong way, which you're not supposed to do. First of all, your children would probably give you trouble for it, but regardless. What I have here is more explanation related to a long access or longitudinal um, view using an ultrasound probe. So I took the image from the previous slide, I have it on the left, and in the middle I have our lovely sonocyte model showing us how she holds the probe longitudinally when she's got, so she's got in her right hand the cannula, the needle, and in her left hand she's holding the probe, and that's how she holds it to get a longitudinal view. On the right hand side of this slide, you see an image of actually the longitudinal view of a graft. Graphs show up in a unique way that their walls appear to be double walled. So that's how you know when you're looking at the ultrasound that you have a graft that you're looking at. It can help identify the type of access that you're going to be cannulating or the one that you're assessing. When you do a short access or cross sectional view, I have taken the picture from the previous slides and shown how the probe looks in a cross-sectional. And once again, our lovely model is showing us how to hold the probe to get a cross-sectional view on the screen of your ultrasound machine. So she's got in her right hand the 15-gauge needle for cannulation. In the left hand, she has the probe. And here we have, on the far right of our slide deck, the image of a cross-sectional view of a fistula in a patient's arm. So this is actually somebody who volunteered to allow me to take pictures of their arm with the ultrasound. So hopefully you have an idea of the difference between what cross-sectional and longitudinal views are. The orientation of the probe matters. Using the ultrasound for cannulation. All right, so first of all, you gotta get the ultrasound to the patient's bedside. And I encourage you at this particular point in your day, I recognize you're busy, I recognize that dialysis nursing can often feel like an assembly line thing. You've got patients waiting to be put on and they're glaring at you because you're not moving fast enough and you're taking your time. Well, you know what? It pays to take your time when it comes to ultrasound use for guided cannulation. I recommend that you take the time to move the equipment. You might have limited capacity to do so because you have very small area, but still take the time, place the ultrasound in a way such that when you are cannulating the patient's arm, you simply have to do a very small turn of your head to view the screen and then back to the arm. As opposed to having the ultrasound behind your shoulder here, where you're doing this to look at the screen and then back at the arm. First of all, that can be very physically uncomfortable for you. When you add physical stress, such as craning your neck to look at a screen, you're gonna to add to your own personal stress during the process. But if you set it up so that there's minimum of movements and that you keep your own physical status relaxed, this can help you manage it in a more positive way. So please take the time to move the chair, move the bed, move the machine, the bedside table, and set it up. Naturally, sometimes that means asking the patient to get out of the chair. Sometimes that's not possible because they're not mobilizing well, but do the best you can to set it up in the proper ergonomic setting. So using the ultrasound for cannulation, in order to do so, you need to add gel to your probe. But there's a lot of infection control departments and facilities that have indicated, rightly so, that there is a proper way to manage the probe to reduce infections between patients or cross-contamination between patients. And that's the use of a probe cover. It is recommended that you use a sterile probe cover as well as sterile gel. I have found personally in my practice to do this put gel inside the probe cover, then put it on the probe. What you're gonna to have to do afterwards is add more gel either onto the patient arm or onto the top of the probe cover. 
if you don't have a lot of gel between the probe and the probe cover, you might find that the image produced by the ultrasound machine is, is not clear. You, you, it looks like you got blank spaces and, and it's not showing you the circle that's supposed to be your vessel. You can't see it very well. It could very well be related to the gel that you're using. If you have sterile ultrasound gel, then you don't have to worry about the gel covering the portion of the skin that you're going to be cannulating through. It will not contaminate because it's already sterile. If you don't have access to sterile ultrasound gel, you do need to keep that in mind because you're going to be maintaining a septic technique during cannulation. You're gonna to have to be careful not to let the gel cover the insertion site if that's the case. It's always prudent to know what your particular facility's infection control parameters are when it comes to the use of the ultrasound in the hemodialysis unit. So it's not simply picking up the machine and running with it and going. It's having robust conversations with other departments about what's the proper way to use this so that we don't put our patients at risk using it. Using the ultrasound for cannulation. So uh, you will notice that if you do the previous things I suggested and you've got a lot of gel everywhere, you're actually going to find that the top of the screen is not indicative of the, the surface of the patient's skin on their arm. In fact, the gel is creating a distance so that this top arrow indicates where the top of the image is and the bottom arrow indicates where actually the surface of the patient's skin is. And this is going to matter if you are determining the depth of the vessel which matters in the angle in which you approach with your cannulation. All right, how you hold the ultrasound for cannulation. So I am going to, at this point, I've got a picture up here of myself holding a probe on a patient's arm. I like to have portions of my hand touching the patient's arm. But I'm going to refer to Kristen here to talk to you about the proper way to hold a probe. Are you there, Kristen? You ready to jump in? Hello, I don't know if you can see, okay. Hi, so a few things about the probe and Adrian's got a great picture up there. Uh, you're going to use a linear probe. So this is also a linear probe. The size of the footprint may vary depending on what probe you have or what system you have. The probe has a few features as well. So on the end of the probe, you have the lens, this gray area. Many people think that the beam comes out of that entire uh, size of the gray area, but it doesn't. The, the width of the probe, the width of the beam is actually about the thickness of a credit card. So how you aim the probe is going to become important, and I'll talk about that in a second. The other thing you need to know if you can see it here, not sure, on the edge of the probe, we have a little bump. That's an orientation indicator. You may have a triangle, a square, a dot, a bump, whatever you have that indicates which direction uh, your image is gonna be displayed. So we like to keep that dot towards your left side if we're looking in short axis. The other thing we have on the probe is this line down the middle. The line down the middle indicates the direct center of the probe. So when Adrienne talks about cannulating, she's gonna show you a guide that can come up on the screen and that will indicate the direct center on the ultrasound screen itself. So when you hold the probe, a light touch is most important, especially when you're doing vascular access. If you push too hard, you're going to collapse your vessel. So if you, the closer you hold down to the end of the probe, and as Adrian's saying, if you can at least anchor one or two fingers on the patient's skin, it will keep the probe from drifting off to one side or the other. It also allows you to hold the probe lightly so as not to compress the vessel and it allows you to turn the probe in different directions without moving around too much. So if we can keep at least a couple fingers on the patient, one or two fingers, we also want to make sure that you keep the probe perpendicular. So if you think about the beam coming out of the end of the probe and it's the thickness of a credit card, you're going to see directly beneath the probe. If I now angle my probe, this way, then I'm shooting the beam out and I'm not seeing what's directly beneath. So you can imagine if I'm putting a needle in, if I'm putting the needle in this way, I'm projecting it farther to one side. If I'm put, putting my needle in from this side, I may never actually see the needle. 
So if I'm holding the probe this way and my needle is coming in here, I may never catch up with the beam, okay? If I'm angling this way, I'm seeing the, the shot hilt of the beam not instead of the tip. So important to keep your probe straight up and down. So what you're seeing is the tip of the needle coming in directly under the probe in the relation to proper relation to the vessel. Back to you, Adrian. Thank you so much. As always, Kristen has been a wonderful resource in my program when it comes to learning about ultrasound. And I'm glad she was able to step in and uh, explain that because she did it a heck of a lot better than I can. So holding the probe matters. How you hold it matters. Essentially, when you've got your probe lined up and you've got that arrow on the probe or the line on the probe, it is going to be in the exact same spot or it's actually going to line up with this guideline that shows up on your screen if you ask it to. So in this particular circumstance on this particular model, you have a choice of using a center line, which is a dotted line that goes down the middle of the screen or the middle of the probe itself, or guide. We use the guide. The guide falls down the center of the probe and it actually has specific distances between each of the dots. The image itself has a depth of, if you look at the bottom right hand side of this image, 2.6 centimeters. My apology to our American uh, uh, joiners, uh, we like to use the metric system here in Canada so I speak in centimeters a lot and hopefully that works for you. It's just over an inch, right? Right, I think so. So in between each of those dots is five millimeters of distance or half a centimeter. And this can allow you to determine the approximate depth and approximate diameter of the vessel that you are cannulating. And like I said previously, it's gonna matter because if it's deep, you're gonna change the angle of the approach for cannulation. And if it's shallow, you're gonna do the same, change the angle of approach. Your ultimate objective is to make the vessel as big as possible, a big circle right in the middle of the screen, because your objective is to get the tip of your cannula in the center of the vessel. And in order to do that, you need to know where the center is. By lining up the vessel with the center line or guideline, you're lining it up with the arrow or line on the probe that you're using. So step one, get the vessel in the middle of the screen. Now, I'm going to show you this slide here, which talks about how to actually cannulate, the physics of walking it in. Essentially what happens is this gray bar here is representing a cannula or a needle you're using to cannulate. This blue bar represents the ultrasound waves, what the probe is sending down into the, into the skin. So, when you cannulate, you're going to use a method of walking it in. This is something that I have shown individuals in my unit to use, and I feel it's one of the best ways to cannulate an individual. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take that cannula and you're going to advance it until you feel that it's in, it's going to be directly underneath the probe. While you're doing this, you're simply looking at your probe and you're aiming for the arrow. When you feel you have reached this objective, the cannula directly under the probe, you will turn your head and watch the ultrasound screen. You are now going to continue watching the ultrasound screen and move your hands independently. The first thing you're going to do is advance the probe up the arm. So let us say we have an individual with a forearm fistula. The anastomosis is by the wrist and this fistula head takes a lovely straight pathway all the way up to the elbow. So we're using the ultrasound to cannulate. We've already introduced the cannula into the vessel and now when we turn our head the cannula shows up as a bright white spot in the middle of the vessel. Well now we want to advance it ensuring that the tip stays in the center of the vessel. The first thing we would do is advance the probe until we lose sight of the cannula. We then bring the cannula back into the image on the screen. This is why you're only watching the screen. You are moving your hands in very small increments, millimeters only, fractions of an inch. You're gonna move the probe till you lose sight of the cannula again and bring it into the field of view. You might at this point have to make some corrections at your angle because if you continue on the same angle, you might hit the anterior wall or back wall. 
We want to aim for the center. The tip has to be in the center. That's essentially the basics of how to walk it in. Now, thankfully, Kristen was lovely enough to create this video, not only with the ultrasound image on the right-hand side, but with herself using the probe for cannulation. So this is a live image she's capturing on the left-hand side. You will see the cannula there approaching the vessel and she's moving her probe only incrementally. So if you watch her hands, very small movements are used. She's actually going to change and do the longitudinal view here. And the nice part about a longitudinal view is it can, you can watch yourself and you can avoid backwalling. You're only gonna get a superior image like she did if you're in the center of the vessel. If you're off to the side and you try a longitudinal view, your image may not be quite as clear and, and you get confused as to about where your cannula is. So try the cross-sectional method of walking it in and then when you become proficient and you're confident that your cannula is in the middle of the vessel, you can do a longitudinal view for advanced medication. You can, in some circumstances, use the cross-sectional for cannulating and then when you're done, do a longitudinal to check placement of it. I hope that makes sense to you. All right, so once again, I'm going to show you a live video of cannulating a fistula in a patient of walking it in. You will notice that you lose sight of the cannula, then it comes into view. You lose sight of the cannula, it comes into view. If we kept the probe still while we were cannulating the, the access, we would be watching the tip and then we'd only be watching the shaft of the cannula itself. And if we don't check where that tip is on a regular basis, chances are if you continue in that same direction, you're going to back wall, have an interstitial event, cause acute injury to the access. So the number one question you have to ask yourself is where's my tip? Where's my tip? Confirm, confirm, reconfirm. That's your objective. All right. So those are the basics of how to use ultrasound for guided cannulation. Trust me. It can be very frustrating. And I would not recommend that you start using it on somebody who has a complex access. If you have the luxury of cannulating a patient that you have not missed on before, or that you very rarely miss on and they have a nice big access, that's who you need to start your practice on. The for sures, the patients who don't make you sweat when you see them because you can cannulate with your eyes closed. Use the ultrasound with them. Get used to that process. So that when you have a complex access in front of you, you feel a little bit more confident about the actual physical skill set that needs to accompany that. Once you've passed that point, or perhaps you want to use the ultrasound not for guided cannulation because you don't quite feel confident enough, you want to have more simulated learning sessions before you do that, you can use the ultrasound to assess accesses. And a lot of times, what I get with people who are becoming more comfortable and proficient with the ultrasound use is questions about what is it that I'm looking at? So what I'm gonna do in this next section is re review a few things that you might be looking at so you know how to identify them. We're gonna look at how to identify a fistula versus a graft, and we've kind of covered that already. Uh, what a pseudoaneurysm looks like. What acute injury presents as. What a branching vessel looks as looks at and how do you capture the diameter and the depth the exact numbers of measurement for particular accesses especially if you're trying to determine if the access is mature enough for cannulation so this first slide shows the image on the left of a fistula and the image on the right of a graft now i think you can safely assume that the image on the right shows a pristine graft if you're lucky enough to have a patient who has a vintage graft and in our unit, we actually have a patient who has a graft that is 19 years old. Let me tell you, her graft doesn't present in this way. The anterior wall or back wall, or posterior wall, back wall, does present beautifully pristine. But because she's had multiple cannulations, there is actually a breakdown of the PTFE material, that is a graft that we use in my particular program. And it almost looks like the top wall there, the, the anterior wall, is, is um, chewed up. So, but that's the basic differences between a fistula and a graft. Areas of acute injury. I took this picture of a patient's access, one treatment after they had experienced a pretty substantial interstitial event. They presented for dialysis with a lot of bruising on their access arm and some tenderness. 
If you take a look at this image, the arrow is pointing to the swelling that's happening within the vessel from the injured area. What happened was a back wall event. They entered the back wall and it is now inflamed and endematous. So the arrow itself actually follows where the injury is. If you use the ultrasound to assess an access like this that presents as bruising, what you can potentially do is avoid the areas of acute injury in that access that are already there. If you can find an area in the access that doesn't have this acute injury, that's where you would choose to cannulate one treatment after an interstitial event. In this particular image, I have a artery and a vein, and the vein is top and the artery is the bottom. What I did with the probe is I pushed down on the actual patient's arm and I compressed or tried to compress the vessels. A fistula made of a vein is easily compressible, whereas the artery not so easily compressible. And if you continuously look at this image, you will notice that the artery is more pulsatile than the, ve the vein is. And that's how you would identify between the two structures. Once again, here's of the access. Given time, these areas of injury will repair themselves, but I do recommend not cannulating in these areas of injury if you have the option to not cannulate there. Here's a simple longitudinal view of a fairly aneurysmal access in my dialysis unit. You will see that as the vessel uh, goes from left to right, it has a fairly small moderate diameter on the left-hand side and the diameter just increases. Naturally, what happens with repeated cannulation in the same site is we break down the integrity of the vessel wall and we get enlarged areas of the access. And on the right-hand side, we're approaching an area of frequent cannulation on this patient's access. Here's the picture of an actual collection of fluid on the top of a vascular access that had experienced acute injury during cannulation. So it kind of looks like a little bit of uh, active fluid. Here is a fairly damaged wall of a graft in a patient's arm. You can no longer discern the double wall on the top there. It's, it's non-existent. It's been chewed up by so many cannulations. This one's interesting. We don't get a lot of stents in my um, dialysis unit, but this one I was able to capture a cross-sectional image of what a stent looks like in a vascular access. A lot of conversation going on between the collaborative in my province about should you cannulate a stent or shouldn't you? Because uh, stents tend to be made up of PTFE uh, material, the same stuff that grafts are, but there is some question that if you put a needle through the infrastructure or it, it, the scaffolding of a stent that you might damage it and then that no longer, it no longer serves its purpose. So you have to follow your own unit protocols as it relates to stents, but it's good to be able to identify where they are on the access. This is how a stent would present a cross-sectional view, and this shows you how a stent would present in a longitudinal view. Here is the use of colored Doppler. You see basically two colors, um, red, orangey color, and blue color. A lot of times as nurses, as we might not identify that as arterial flow versus uh, venous flow. But the color differentiation with an ultrasound is simply due to the fact that one color um, captures blood flowing towards the probe and the other color captures blood flowing away from the probe. We would use this particular color uh, Doppler if we suspected that an access was close to being clotted or was clotted. By using this, we can confirm whether or not there is actual flow through the access. And um, it'll help you determine, like you're, using the ultrasound is never going to replace the physical assessment that you do for an access. Look, listen, feel. Look, listen, feel is what you do before every cannulation. You may choose to bring the ultrasound as one of the tools that you use in that look, listen, feel assessment. It would come in the look part. And you could, after you've assessed the access, you might determine that the thrill isn't present. You can't hear a buoy. You might want to use the color Doppler to confirm that flow is no longer happening through that access. Then you can avoid cannulating an access that is thrombosed. And instead you can move to next steps is, can we do something, some kind of intervention to assist with this thrombosed access? 
Sometimes when you are using the ultrasound at the bedside, you might come across a structure or something that you see and you have problems identifying exactly what it is. You'd like to have a meaning, meaningful conversation with your coworker or perhaps the educator or mentor in your, that you have access to in your unit who is proficient at using ultrasound. Well, in this particular circumstance, you might want to capture a picture so that you can refer to it later in a conversation. And um, you can do that by simply, in this particular model of the sauna site, pressing the camera button and it'll capture a picture of what you're seeing on the screen, below which is a picture of a video camera. You would hit that and it would capture a video clip of a limited uh, duration. Um, Kristen, I'm going to get you to discuss the fact that while this may not appear to be an option on your model when it comes to sauna site, um, sauna site use, there are various models, but you still have the potential to use this image and video clip option. Yeah, definitely. So for those of you that have the newer S2 ultrasound, which is what Adrian's showing you here, you'll see that camera and you'll see the clip option. The clip option can also be preset. You get anywhere from two to 60 seconds on your clip if you choose. For those of you, a lot of people in Ontario at least have the older version of the S model, which is the S cath or the S nerve, uh, something like that. It's a brown uh, flat screen with lots of buttons on the side. In that case, you don't see the camera and the video camera readily apparent, but along the bottom of the monitor, you should see something, a freeze button or um, and a save button. So if you want to measure uh, or capture an image, you can hit that freeze button. It'll hold your image still. And then you can hit the save image and the image will be saved to the ultrasound system. If you have a laptop style system uh, from Sonosite, you will see the uh, camera button and you'll be able to save, or you'll have a save image button also along the bottom uh, of the machine. Uh, other, other manufacturers will also have this feature. You just have to check with your application specialist or your, your rep to see how you can go about saving the images. You can pull them up from the patient review button. And if anyone has any specific questions about recording, saving images, or where to find them once you have saved them, if you put a question into the Q&A box, and then I can try and answer uh, specifically to your model how you can go about doing that. Thanks, Is that good, Adrian. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. As always, she's an excellent resource. She's the reason why I was able to capture images that I've embedded in this actual slide deck. I hope that they've been helpful. I continue to capture these images and I use them within my own facility to help support education related to ultrasound guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit. So if you're using the ultrasound, you have the luxury of assessing an access before it even needs to be cannulated. Let's say you have somebody presenting for dialysis with a dual access, they have a central line in, and they have an access that's waiting for, um, to be ready for cannulation, you should take advantage of that and take the time to assess that access. So you're using the ultrasound not for cannulation, but just to look at the vessel. You'd be surprised at how engaged the patient becomes in what you're looking at. And if you have the capacity to briefly explain what you're looking at, then they become even more interested. So often when it comes to determining whether an access is mature enough for cannulation, um, we used to follow the rules of sixes from the Fistula First program. New KDOKI guidelines have kind of changed it briefly. They do support the idea of the rule of sixes, but they don't make it a guideline anymore. They'll say, for example, that your access needs to be uh, equivalent to or less than five millimeters below the surface of the skin, which is half a centimeter, and it should be just as wide. So in this particular circumstance, I took the time to measure the diameter of somebody's existing well-matured fistula, and on the bottom right hand side the caliper measurement tells me that this vessel is 1.23 centimeters in diameter so you can use the ultrasound to get exact measurements not only of the width or the height of the vessel but the depth of the vessel from the surface of the skin to the top of the vessel itself so becoming proficient at ultrasound use i wish i could tell you that i have ways my waved my magic wand and all viewers of this education session will now go out into the wild and cannulate like superstars i hope you do and i hope you already have the capacity to do that but 
I do recommend, like I mentioned earlier, get comfortable with handling the equipment without cannulating at first. Use any type of simulation education that you can. Uh, a blue Phantom, a fake arm for cannulation so that when you're cannulating and getting used to how to hold the probe, you're not actually putting a live patient through that. You've got something that's simulated to use it. You can use the ultrasound to assess the pathway, the depth and the diameter of the vessel to confirm cannula placement. So you can use the ultrasound after you've cannulated. Just, you know, I think I got that. I think I nailed that cannulation. I think the tip of that cannula is in the middle of the vessel. Why not use the ultrasound to see if that actually was achieved? Try to focus on watching the screen while you move the probe up and down the arm to, come, to become more comfortable at performing this action. In this particular slide, this is me running a slide up a patient's access. They had a forearm fistula, so I went from just above the anastomosis to almost the elbow. And you will see there's an actual capture of a branching vessel right there on the right-hand side. It looked like a, a road going off to the side. That's what a branching vessel could look like. It can also look like a dot that leaves the big dot and then goes off to the side. That's what a branching vessel can present as when you're looking at it in an ultrasound. Allow yourself sufficient time to perform these initial guided cannulations. Prepare your patient by explaining your plan and obtaining their consent to this plan. They might be completely frustrated because of things that happened during their day and their ride was late and they're getting on late and they don't want that to be used. We kind of, you know, we have to respect if they say no, then no it is. Use mentors within your program to coach you through the guided cannulation. Um, this might be the educator who's uh, rolling out the ultrasound. It might be somebody who shows proficiency, who's a front, front line bedside nurse. It could simply be that you don't have mentors in your unit. Well, then engage in conversation with somebody else who's interested in becoming proficient at the use of ultrasound. And you'll find that if you have somebody else on your side, you're going to have interesting conversations. Reach out to all the resources you have access to to answer your questions. And expect to perform multiple successful guided cannulations with coaching prior to uh, performing independently if you have that luxury in your program. Whenever possible, ask somebody to coach you through. You're the one operating all of the equipment, but you have somebody behind you who's gently reminded you, okay, look up at the screen, now look down at the arm. Oh, you're drifting. You're not holding your arm still. The probe is moving across the arm. You gotta remember to hold that as still as possible. Coach gently. Don't bark out orders or reach over around somebody to press buttons. So essentially, uh, that's the end of uh, our education session related to guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit. I hope I've had some value added to the information related to, uh, to this particular skill set, and I'm more than happy to answer any outstanding questions that you might have at this time. Thank you, Adrian, for an excellent presentation. I've learned a ton. <laughs> so we will go ahead and take some questions in the Q&A box now. And Carol, I will turn it over to you. All right, I'm here. Um, so Adrian, um, question about if I, I happen to, it says, I happen to have a new fistula that appeared uh, that two vessels were overlaying one another. And when I checked the color mode, the top one was mainly blue and the bottom vessel has a mixed blue and red color. How do I interpret this? Ah, okay, so where you've got the mixed color, you can just assume there's higher flow, more turbulence happening. Um, I don't know if that question leads into the next question of which one's the actual fistula, which one is the actual vessel that I'm aiming for. Uh, you might be looking at a vein and an artery. Um, it would help if you have the capacity to follow that vessel from the anastomosis all the way up the arm. In general, uh, with forearms and upper arms, the cephalic vein is what's used as the primary vessel, and it tends to run fairly midline. It can slightly go lateral or medial based on the patient. But if you're having problems identifying which one is the fistula, which one should you be cannulating, you need to call somebody in with a little bit more experience, a sonographer, your nephrologist, a radiologist, your access uh, coordinator, to see if they can help you with identification there. But that, that's a really good question. I hope I answered part of it. All right, well, we'll see if we have a follow-up here. Um, 
uh, a different one uh, for Adrian again, being an experienced user of ultrasound, would you personally support the idea of ultrasound cannulation being um, considered a best practice? Oh, oh yes, I would. I can't tell you how it has changed my own practice and confidence levels, but when I have individuals in my unit who show um, proficiency, uh, their ability to confidently move forward and to have and create a positive patient experience, decrease interstitial events, decrease patient anxiety, increased comfort levels of the patient during the dialysis process. All these three things that impact the patient in a positive way indicate that, yes, indeed, this should be part of the best practice. But you're going to get a variety of people who will argue with you on that. I most definitely endorse it as such. Excellent. Um, all right, another question. Um, when cannulating an AV fistula, will the blood return come back quickly? Um, thinking due to arterial flow in there, um, what happens if I cannulate and then lose the blood return? Hopefully okay, so, okay. I, I'm assuming you're talking about the flashback that you see in the hub of the needle after you cannulate, and that's solely dependent upon the flows within that access. Um, if you were to compare a forearm to an upper arm, in general, upper arms tend to have higher flows, so you would get more flashback. When you cannulate somebody with a low flow access, there is a chance that you will not see flashback, but that does not mean you're not in the vessel. It simply means that the flows through that access are low. You could be looking at a sweet 90 year old woman with a blood pressure of 80 over nothing, and uh, don't expect to have big flashback when you cannulate her. I hope that answers that question. Cool. Um, oh, well, I like this one. Your presentation is fantastic and we teach the same way. Uh, is it possible to have access to this presentation to show it to our dialysis nurses? Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're planning on uh, having our lovely Laura edit a recorded um, option of this webinar so it can be accessed by people. Yes. Yes, and you can see the link on this last slide here, the secure.sonosite.com behind dash the scan. Um, it'll be posted there hopefully by the end, end of the day. Great. All right. Um, I have questions, a couple questions on how, how do you turn on the, the needle guide? Ah, the guideline down the middle of the screen? Well, it's dependent upon the uh, model that you do have. Um, you're either going to use guideline if you want to have uh, distance between the dots uh, captured, or you can use center line. Um, so simply pressing that button engage starts it and pressing it again stops it. Uh, you will find that if you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kristen, but if you turn it off, when you turn the machine back on again, it won't be there. You have to turn it on. Is that right? So the guide will stay on no matter what, even if you turn the system off. If you do change probes or if you have a hard reset of your system, the guide will go away. Um, I see one of the people uh, who's asking about the guide has the Sonosite Edge. Uh, if you have the Sonosite Edge, then you have to go to page two of the soft keys. So when you're looking at the monitor, underneath there will be uh, a list of tabs. The far right tab says page one of two. You're going to push it and get to page two of two, and then you'll see the button for center line, and you can turn the center line on that way. Thank goodness for you, Kristen. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, another one for you, probably, Kristen. If our facility decides to purchase a sauna site, what kind of training and assistance will the company provide? Uh, so when you provide when you purchase a sauna site, uh, I know from my experience, I go and put the system together. I'll give some training to your biomed on how to look after the system, and then. Uh, generally, we'll, we'll come up, show you how to use the system. We do have phantoms available. We can do some workshops uh, on phantoms. And I think Adrian will tell you we're, we're pretty accessible and we do come back time and again if you need us. Yes, a lot of my front, uh, my front line bedside nurses will call Kristen directly instead of talking. To <laughs> All right. And we're, we're happy to help. We do um, not, we're not nurses. I will, I will uh, just say that we are not nurses, so we will not cannulate actual patients while we're there. 
um, but we are happy to, to bring the phantoms and get you used to using the ultrasound uh, and get the needle coordination on a phantom. Um, Laura, I just have a question for you. If we don't get to all these um, all these questions now, will it be possible to um, get them addressed after the fact? Or Absolutely. You, you actually just read my mind, Carol. Um, I can see a number of questions in here. Uh, luckily, Zoom saves the questions in the Q&A box, so we can reach out to people individually um, with their answers, because we are at the top of the hour, and I do want to be respectful of Adrienne's time since she's given us so much information today. Um, so why don't we do that and go ahead and close out the webinar and I will make sure these questions are all saved. And those of you who have asked questions, uh, looks like there's only one anonymous one. Um, geez. Yeah, we will just, we'll post the recording of this afterwards and uh, we will reach out to the questions that are still in the Q&A box here. Uh, so for one more minute, go ahead and answer, enter your Q and questions in the Q&A box so we can make sure we capture those. Uh, but Adrian, Carol, Kristen, everybody, thank you so much for a fantastic webinar. This was, was exceptional. Thank you.